Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Miranda Janelle, Justin Zellers, and Pepper Giese. Coming up on DTNS, Max Scoville gets us up to date on the summer of game news. Backblaze has the data on SSDs versus spinning drives. And TikTok copies Be Real. Is TikTok over now? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 15th, the Ides of September 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, senior writer and host at IGN, Max Scoville. Welcome back. Howdy. Thanks for having me. Good to have you, man. Uh, did you survive the Ethereum merge? Uh, you know, it, I it had like a little bit of a, a reaction, but otherwise I think I got through it okay. <laughs> Put a salve on it and everything's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, the, uh, the Ethereum merge uh, has gone down successfully. You can see Wednesday's show if you want to know what that means. Uh, let's start this show with a few tech things you should know. Adobe announced it plans to acquire the collaborative design platform Figma in a $20 billion deal expected to close in 2023, although it still needs regulatory and Figma stockholder approval. Co-founder and CEO Dylan Field will remain in charge of the company, saying that Adobe was deeply committed to keeping it autonomous. Figma currently has over 4 million users. Bloomberg's Katie Roof reports this is the largest buyout of a private software company ever. Yeah. Autonomous and free. Free would be nice, too. Uh, Snap made Snapchat for web available to all users. Uh, so if you didn't have access already, well, now you do. Feature launched back in July, but was limited to Snapchat Plus subscribers in select markets. As somebody who uses Instagram on the web, I welcome this. Might maybe mm -hmm. use Snapchat a little bit more often. Intel, ARM, and NVIDIA published a draft specifications for an open and license-free 8-bit floating-point standard, or FP8, for AI development. Floating-point formats are part of building an AI system. More bits generally mean higher accuracy, but they also require more memory to train an AI model on the FP8 standard. Uh, in a white paper on that standard, NVIDIA says it shows comparable accuracy to 16-bit precisions in many use cases. Earlier this month, the UK's Competition and Markets Authority gave Microsoft five days to resolve concerns about its pending acquisition of Activision Blizzard. The Financial Times sources say Microsoft did not offer any remedies because it was unclear any would have prevented the investigation. Basically, they're like, anything we said wouldn't have mattered, so we didn't say anything. Uh, the CMA is now expected to begin an in-depth phase two investigation of the deal. Microsoft also faces an in-depth investigation in the European Union, and the company is going to file its case there formally in the coming weeks. Microsoft still hopes to close the deal by June next year. Good luck with that. Uh, as to what conditions it might have to agree to, Sony has some ideas. Uh, Sony would like guarantees that it will have access to all Activision Blizzard games on equal terms to everybody else in perpetuity. Uh, that's a lot to ask, but Microsoft has said it wants, quote, people to have more access to games, not less. So maybe there's a middle ground. In its latest ruling, Meta's oversight board criticized the company's automated moderation tools. This stemmed from a political cartoon of a Colombian police officer beating a man with batons. Meta added the image to its media matching service database, meaning that it would automatically be taken down whenever posted. 250, 215 people appealed different removals, with 98% of appeals deemed successful. However, Meta didn't remove the image from the database until the board took up this case. The board called for a more responsive system that would trigger a review of the media matching service when an image was successfully appealed. It asked Meta to publish error rates for content mistakenly included in the database. All right, let's get to that uh that story that's just <laughs> going to end TikTok. It's over. It's over for it, right? Tom, Tom don't, don't, maybe not, maybe not. Hear us out. TikTok right. announced it will launch TikTok Now in the U.S., which sends a daily prompt at a random time that gives you three minutes to capture a photo or a 10-second video using the front and rear cameras. You might say, eh, doesn't this sound a lot like Be Real? And you would be right. It's because that's exactly what it does. Right down to the alert that uses a lightning emoji at either end instead of the alert emojis that Be Real uses. So pretty much a ripoff here. A mock-up shows a dedicated Now tab where the Friends tab is. And TikTok says markets outside the U.S. may get time to Now as a separate app. The default setting will only be to let friends, that's people that you follow who also follow you, so, you know, 
It's a two-way street. See these posts at this time. If you're over 18, you can change that and share with the Explore feed so other people can see it as well. Now, uh, I'm kidding about TikTok being over, but imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and we've seen it before. Snapchat recently added the front and back dual camera, just like Be Real, to its main camera toolbar. Instagram added a feature called Dual, D-U-A-L, to Reels, lets you use the front and back camera. And even more like Be Real, in August, an app researcher named Alessandro Paluzzi showed off screenshots of an Instagram prototype called IG Candid Challenges, which sent a notification at a random time that gave you two minutes to capture and share a photo. Uh, so does this mean that Be Real is simply such a great idea uh, that it got absorbed into existing platforms? Could it be the next Snapchat, which Instagram also tried to copy several years ago and kind of legitimized uh, with stories? Or is TikTok simply trying to catch up? And so it's hurting for ideas, copying newer apps. Uh, what does it all mean, Sarah? Well, uh, good question. I think that um, to use the Instagram versus Snapchat um, example, Instagram has been pretty successful there. Uh, Snapchat certainly has lots of users still, but many Instagram Stories users are former Snapchat folks who said, well, everybody was on Instagram anyway, and it was the same thing more or less, so I'm just there now. Um, in fact, it's part of the most, um, the part of uh, Instagram that I feel many of my friends uh, spend time on the most, even though, even though I don't. Uh, be Real, I'm not, a, I'm not a Be Real user currently. Uh, Max, I'm not sure if you are, but I know that it is definitely the new hotness, and mm -hmm. it just makes sense that any company, especially TikTok, which is still kind of its new hotness, would want to use those features and, 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 and fold them into their own platform. Yeah, I mean, I think it's smart because obviously TikTok has a huge, you know, huge wealth of users to pull from. And if they add a feature that's not too much of a lift to kind of, you know, put that there and give them give their users the option to use it, that's going to prevent them from moving on to whatever the hot new thing is. And I, you know, it's probably smart to do that now rather than to try to have to, you know, play catch up later. Uh, I mean, we just talked about how Snapchat adding web support, that feels a lot like they're trying to catch up with TikTok. Because I see so many TikToks posted on, like, you know, on a browser. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of what I absorb on TikTok is on the web just because I like web interfaces. We talked about this on GDI yesterday. It's like, give me a web interface. I will mm -hmm. use this more. I, I think the question is whether Be Real is Meerkat or Snapchat and TikTok, right? Instagram uh, put in stories, which actually did okay uh, imitating Snapchat, didn't run Snapchat out of business though, uh, and Reels, which imitates TikTok, and jury's still out on, some people think Reels is, is a flop, uh, but it certainly didn't hurt TikTok. Whereas Meerkat uh, was taken on by Periscope and Twitter mm -hmm. bought Periscope and nobody remembers Meerkat anymore. Uh, so is Be Real that thing that is quickly spiking right now, but will fade away because it's just a feature, not a business? Uh, or is it going to be more like Snapchat where it expands and finds other things uh, that it's good for? I don't know that I have the answer. I'm a little skeptical that Be Real can do anything else without getting its user base upset because it's very much about being in the moment, being real and, and not having influencers, et cetera, involved. It's a cool idea, but it feels kind of antithetical to what makes social media you know, popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like there's so much of that that is sort of this, you know, voyeurism and ex exhibitionism of being like, oh, like, a, let me show you my best side. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that like said, though, Be Real like is, I mean, it is, has had a huge uptick um, in, in, in its user base over a very short period of time to the point where a lot of folks ask me, Sarah, have you heard of Be Real? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> okay. You got to get on it's it. It's it's, it's definitely not, reaching my non-technical friends at this point. It's easy. It's easy to do. Some people, my, my wife, it, she continues to use it, but she complains every time. She's like, ah, I don't have anything good to take a picture of right now. I'm like, it's kind of the point, you know. It's being, kind of the point because it's know. real life. I think um, we've seen an interesting sort of rise of these kind of page a day calendar apps. Uh -huh. Like like Wordle is very much like that. Um, yeah. I play Framed, which is like the movie version of Wordle. Um, and it's just, it's, Ooh, it's, that, that like, it's great. It shows like a screen cap of a movie and you have to guess what it is. Oh, that's great. Say, yeah. It's really fun. But I mean, it's that, it's that, you know, little, little daily routine thing. And I think there's mm -hmm. something much more digestible about like, 
let me snap a photo of whatever it is I'm doing. And the whole emphasis is on it not being staged and like perfectly manicured. It's kind of like, let's just let me just get this out of the way and then move on with my day. I yeah, think that's, I don't that's a good way. Doing it. It's like a good way to put it. it. It's like I am a participant in this fun thing that a lot of other people are participating in, but no one's better than anybody else. You can't really try harder. You just participate. And it's and it's low. It's it's a low ask. Just do it once. Then you're That's done. Right. You don't have to keep doing it. Like you don't get pulled in like the TikTok algorithm or Twitter, et cetera. Yeah. All right, let's talk hard drives. Let's do it. Backblaze is one of the biggest cloud backup providers for folks in the world. And because of that, the company is very concerned with reliability, especially storage reliability, regularly publishing findings from its data center on which hard drives last the longest, which hard drives perform the best. And the latest report comes uh, compares rather solid, solid straight drives to spinning hard drives. So let's call them SSDs and HDDs. Backblaze now has five years of data on both. They have more than that on HDDs, but uh, unfortunately, Black Backblaze doesn't have data on a lot of brands. Uh, they haven't used many Western Digital or SanDisk SSDs. They haven't used any Samsung SSDs, or at least reported little or no data on those. The bulk of their data is coming from Crucial and Micron, Seagate, a lot of Seagate models, and Dell, uh, meaning it's a good comparison overall of SSD and HDD, but less useful at telling us which manufacturers make the most reliable of those drives, which is something it's very useful for on HDDs. Uh, however, it's worth pointing out the Dell Boss VD solid state drive uh, has zero fails and 161,508 drive days. That means it has enough data to give Backblaze some confidence that that particular stat is meaningful. Everything else is either not doing as well or doesn't have enough stats to have a high confidence interval. Yeah, since Black, Backblaze only uses SSDs as boot drives, it only compared them to HDDs that it uses as boot drives as well. So, you know, not exactly the same going on here, but these boot drives... <laughs> Boof drives. <laughs> they're not boof, they're boot. Uh, read, read, write, and delete data, including temp files and log files, among others. So they don't just boot up and then sit idly. Also keep in mind that Backblaze has eight years of HDD data, after which presumably they retire a drive. Just, you know, it goes on the back burner, but only five years max of SSDs at this point. HDDs and SSDs track pretty closely in their data through the first three years. Uh, the HDDs have a slightly higher failure percentage, about two thirds of a percentage point higher. It's not much. Year four starts to see a wider gap. SSD failures jump 0.26%, while HDDs rise 0.48%. So that's almost double the rate of failure in year four. It's still a small amount of failure. Year five is where the difference really appears, and this is the first year that they can compare year five. SSD failures fall slightly from 1.05% to 0.92%. Statistically, you can call that even, though. It's pretty close. While HDDs rise from 1.83% to 3.55%. So hard drives really start to have a failure rate in year five, whereas SSDs don't. Uh, the failure rate rises steeply for HDDs, 5.23% in year six, 6.26% in year seven. The question now is, what will we see next year? Will the SSDs stay on their almost flat curve, or are they finally going to hit the wall and fail at higher rates. Uh, if it doesn't happen next year, which year might that happen? But this is good data to show that solid state drives, very solid, at least through five years of use. Uh, and these are consumer drives being put to use in a you know data center situation. Max, does this change your hard drive buying behavior at all? Uh, I don't buy a ton of hard drives. This this is definitely, I guess, th this, is, this is stupid, but realizing that the cloud still is hard drives. Like I know, I know that in the back of my head in the same way that there are no grown ups. It's just that kind of like, you know, there's that optimism of like, yeah, it's sure, fine. Sure. It's up there. It's safe. It's in the cloud. But um, I mean, hopefully by the time the, you know, the SSDs I have kicking around are, are on their last legs, there's some new and exciting, much sturdier, more reliable option out there. Yeah. Like the cloud. Wait, <laughs> that's a 
good point, though. I mean, I I think somebody might have listened to the story and been like, well, but I don't know. My hard drive was just built into the last laptop that I bought. You know, like, what does this mean to me? Like, what can I do about it? And turns out, yeah, various types of hard drives uh, power lots of things that we, you know, we store things in, we pay money for, and, you know, we, we all will benefit from them uh, working as well as possible. Yeah. Like real clouds are made up of, of drops of water, uh, the the Internet's cloud is made up of other people's hard drives. So keep that in mind. Like sands and through the hourglass. Back up. Roger wanted us to remind everyone, as always, uh, back up your data, because if your hard drive fails, you want a copy of it. So. I learned a valuable lesson about hard drives in high school. I had a uh, Creative Labs Zen Nomad Extra MP3 player. Uh, which I love because it was like an iPod, except it had a removable battery, so you could, you know, replace the battery once it ran out. Um, but that didn't affect it if somebody jumped on your back and you dropped it and fried the hard drive and Ooh. lost all of your music. And mm. then, I don't know, from that point forward, I feel like I've had this just very ephemeral approach to, to data and just been like, it's all going to go away someday. <laughs> Nothing lasts. It doesn't matter. Lasts. Yeah. <laughs> Put yeah. in the cloud. Never fall in love with your data. Uh, folks, if you have a thought about a backup plan for Max or anybody else, uh, send us an email. The email address here is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Now, we may not have had an E3 again this year, but there was plenty of gaming news this summer. Uh, Gamescom happened in Germany. Sony and, and Nintendo uh, just had announcements. The Tokyo Game Show is starting right now. Uh, Max, help us get caught up on the biggest news. What do we got? Sure. So like you said, E3 didn't happen, but Gamescom did, which is a big, huge triumphant return. I got, I got to go out there and, and um, cover it live myself uh, out in Cologne, Germany. Uh, a bunch of the major kind of players actually skipped it. Um, Sony and Nintendo and Activision and EA, uh, none of them showed up, but Xbox was there. There were a bunch of kind of, um, I don't want to say smaller, smaller outlets, but not like those big, huge monolithic mm -hmm. uh, publishers. And there were some, it was kind of, kind of nice because I think we're, we're just now sort of seeing the effects of uh, COVID on, on development. And a lot of things have been pushed and like next year is going to be phenomenal for games. This fall is like a little bit weird because a bunch of the sort of the big, huge things that people were looking forward to got delayed. Uh, and so it's this kind of, I don't know, it's, it's the, the best of the rest um, coming out this fall. And I think as such, we've got a lot of, uh, like, like you said, uh, Sony just did sort of their fall look ahead, um, showing off God of War Ragnarok, which is their big fall release. Uh, Nintendo gave us a release date for the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2, which is officially called Tears of the Kingdom, which is uh, exciting. But um, yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of gaming stuff to talk about. The, I, I would say the biggest sort of surprise that came out of Gamescom was Dead Island 2, which was, I think, announced in, I want to say 2014. Uh, this is the follow-up to the sort of open-world first-person RPG um, Dead Island, which got a couple, it got like a spin-off or two, um, and it sort of got usurped a little bit by, um, what's it called? Uh, God, I'm totally drawing a blank on the name, but it, um, God, it's like a parkour li living dead game. But uh, anyway, basically this game was, people thought it was completely canceled and done for, and then it kind of, you know, appropriately rose from the grave, and it's in playable shape. People previewed it, people, people checked it out, and it's... Um, coming out next year, which is, which is kind of wild. Uh, but yeah, there's, um, as far as the other big surprises, the, the team that did Friday the 13th, uh, the sort of asymmetrical, um, multiplayer horror game is taking their talents and applying them to killer clowns from outer space. The <laughs> campy old, I think 1988 horror movie, which never took itself seriously. And I think it's like really ripe for a, for a video game. So three people play as clowns and four people play as uh, teenagers and the teenagers have to like steal stereos and you know loot stuff and pick up collectibles or whatever and the clowns have to kill them with you know acidic cotton candy or what have you uh, and then what else we got um, there's a Dune game on the way this one feels like it's a long ways off this is mm -hmm. Dune Awakening we just got a big huge sort of um, you know pre-rendered CG trailer for it and it's clearly it's taking the kind of the branding from the the Dennis Villanueva movie but um mm -hmm. It's uh, it's going to be kind of its own thing, and that's from the team that did Conan Exiles. So they have some experience turning, um, you know, turning b beloved ancient hard lore fiction into survival MMORPG material. Uh, but I think you know, kind of wait and see on that one. And then uh, where Winds Meet was a total surprise, which is from a, a Chinese studio, and it looks very much inspired by Ghost of Tsushima, uh, but with a little bit more supernatural stuff going on. It's really just like a huge sprawling really really impressive looking demo the kind that i'm kind of like mm, i'll wait i'll wait and see I'll, I'll believe it when i'm when i'm playing it 
Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of cool that it came out of nowhere. For the Nintendo stuff, uh, if if you are a Breath of the Wild fan, do you feel like Tears of the Kingdom is, is going to be a must when it comes out? I think I'm an outlier in this. I think a, I, a lot of people are extremely excited about this. There's no there's no question in their mind because it, it looks very much like more more of the same in the best way possible. Um, I, I, for one, kind of love it when the Zelda comes out and has a totally new aesthetic and a new style and, and sort of throws out the formula, but that's also uh, totally kind of antithetical to what a smart iterative game design is these days. If <laughs> you spend so. a, if you yeah. make a massive hundred hour RPG open world, like maybe keep some of the systems around. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's, it's going to be sort of a more of an aerial approach. Like you're going to be, um, on floating islands above, above Hyrule and there will probably be some new physics systems to, to mess around with. And I mean, people got, people got a lot of mileage out of that last one. So I think there'll be a lot more, a lot more to play with, with this one. I, I, I know people who played it day one and are still playing it now. Yeah. Just, no, it's, you know. it's one of those games. Like it's, yeah. it's easily like a top five all time desert Island game. If you have to pick one. Anything else from the Nintendo announcement? Yeah, uh, Pikmin 4 is apparently happening. The last we heard about this was in 2017, I believe, or hmm. that's when it was announced, and Miyamoto came out and said, great news, it's um, it's almost done. Whatever that means, but it's you know, more <laughs> Pikmin. Uh, Pikmin you know, 3.9, it's almost yeah. done. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I, you know, this this should be huge, because I mean, the Switch, Switch install base at this point is just massive and huge, and I think Nintendo's come out with sort of entries in its flagship series that maybe didn't necessarily make a huge splash before. And because of how many people are on switch, they've compl it's completely blown up. Like animal crossings, new horizons was just, mm -hmm. um, they kind of like just struck gold with that. And it also was the perfect timing for it. And I've never gotten into Pikmin. So I'm kind of, I'm curious about this. You know, I have a switch. I might mess around with it. It's a, uh, you know, small vermin that you're, are your friends, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Probably easy to pick up, right? Yeah. And Anything then, uh, else uh, from yeah. Nintendo there? Um, not on the Nintendo front so much. There is some other stuff coming out of uh, TGS. The sort of the big thing at Sony's uh, big presentation the other day was uh, Tekken 8 got a big official thing shown off. And it's, you know, it's more Tekken. It looks really impressive. They're clearly just really pushing hard with, you know, next-gen graphics and all that. Uh, and the other, the other big thing is the Yakuza series, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, they announced that they are localizing slash remastering this... Um, Fan, not not a fan favorite. It's one the fans have been demanding. It's it's uh, set in samurai times, and so they're going through and doing a whole full HD upres and all that. Um, and so you know, it's it's the thing that you go to any like any Yakuza interview, and the comments are like, "When's Ishin coming out? When is this coming out?" So they, the devs can finally stop answering that question because they're putting it out along with two other games that they also announced. So those those guys keep pretty busy, but um, yeah, a lot of games to look forward to. Yeah, before we move on, uh, Tokyo Game Show underway. I know there, there's been a lot of uh, stuff, including these Sony and Nintendo announcements, kind of in advance of it. Anything you're looking forward to over the, the last few days of it? Um, I mean, Hideo Kojima was tweeting weird images, which is pretty par for the course mm -hmm. with him. I'm always excited to see what that guy's up to. Um, I would love to see Konami do something with the Metal Gear franchise or Castlevania or Silent Hill or anything like that, but I'm not really holding my breath on that front. Uh yeah, I mean, three Yakuza games is is pretty much more than I could ask for. Yeah, yeah. TGS. <laughs> that, that is pretty good. Like, and and before day one, for that matter. So, yeah, nice. Well, just a reminder, uh, when we roll into GDI after DTNS wraps up, uh, if any of y'all have thoughts about stuff that you're looking forward to or games that you already like uh, that the rest of us should know about, uh, do weigh in, and we'll kick that around a little bit. But first, we're going to kick around something... The Wall Street Journal calls uh, in search of a silent leaf blower. You might say, you mean those kind of leaf blowers? Yes, that's exactly what they're talking about. It will strike at the heart of lots of homeowners or people who live close to homeowners. Mark Huco is a mechanical engineer in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who ditched his gas-powered leaf blower for a handheld blower with a rechargeable 40-volt battery from a company called Ryobi's Whisper Series. Huco's Ryobi can outpower many new gassed fuel backpack models, and his Ryobi clocks in at 57 decibels. You might say, mm, how loud is that? Well, it's a lot less than what most people hate most about leaf blowers. They clock in closer to 74 quite a bit quieter. As for limitation, there are some. Both of the two 40-volt uh, batteries that came with the blower can only power the tool up to 60 minutes at its lowest speed. Mm. The Ryobi 40-volt HP Brushless 650 CFM Whisper Series blower kit includes a 6-amp hour battery that can run for 80 minutes at the lowest speed for $279. So this is 
not totally cost prohibitive. Uh, it definitely, depending on what you got to blow uh, and how many leaves are falling around your property, um, you know, it may make more sense for some rather than others. But Max, does this strike at the heart of things that you hate most? I'm actually, I'm, I'm sort of a leaf blower apologist. I had, a, I think, the model <laughs> down from the Rio B you showed, up, showed off there. Uh, until somebody stole it off my porch, but uh, oh, no. it, you know, I I don't have a lot of trees or a lot of leaves, but I you know for grass clippings and getting dirt off my porch and stuff, it was handy. Um, but I told my mom that I had a leaf blower, and she was like, "Oh no, I've signed a petition to get those banned in Sonoma. <laughs> They're so loud, and it's just uh, yeah. it's I, a lot of your people mom hate them. is yeah. perhaps my neighbor. <laughs> yeah, no, she, <laughs> yeah, people aren't aren't wild about these things, but I don't know. I'm all for just less, uh, I guess, gas powered household devices in general you know i think mm -hmm. like a battery powered thing um you know if it's if it's not <laughs> ear splittingly loud that's that's fine but also you know wouldn't hurt to rake some leaves either yeah in my day we had a leaf blower it was called a rake it was yeah, quiet well, and it was listen. good for you get off my leaf filled lawn because come I'm too hang out on my property sometime there's plenty of raking going on but there's also a lot of leaf blowing yeah. and it's yeah i mean it's just it's a mess it's noisy. It's also stinky. I hate leaf blowers. I understand that they do a good job. And when they're done, I'm happy they were here. But anything, even if it's a little bit more limited based on, you know, battery usage and that sort of thing, uh, anything that can just make your neighbors hate you less, I feel like, is not the worst thing. In the world. I'm all for a lot less noise. I'm all for power efficiency. Uh, still, I hold a grudge against leaf blowers, not even just for the noise and the gas use, uh, but for the fact that they are misused often uh, to blow away things that you paid to be there, <laughs> like, you know, mulch and pebbles uh, and things. I've, I've run into that where I've, I've like, oh, why did you do that? Why did you blow over there? Like, well, I don't want that to be blown away. I want that to mm -hmm. stay there. Uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to the teleporter day where you can just have an AI scan your lawn for leaves and then tell it like teleport those leaves to the compost area. The uh, drone leaf blower. Can we drone, get a, like a yard? Drone Roomba? comes down. Drone does its thing. Drone leaves. Just picks the leaves, right? Yeah. Just, just take the leaves. Just the leaves that we want. And then gone. Put them one at a time. Just picks yeah. them up and just chop lifts them elsewhere. It takes a while, but yeah, very job. small drones. <laughs> each one picking up one. <laughs> but but very precise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Paul. This is uh, in response to our our uh, conversation yesterday about folks who use cell phones versus folks who use computers, desktop computers, and how they might lie differently. Paul says, my opinion on the cause of the difference in cell fo phones versus computers has to do with the cell phone being a more intimate device versus the computer. Cell phone is held in your hand. Computer sits on a table, dispassionately waiting for you to type on it so that the person you're talking to on the computer is that much less of a human. Yeah, the, uh, the study we talked about yesterday said that people with who communicated through laptops in the study tended to lie a lot more than people who use cell phones. Uh, and I like this. I like this idea, the cell phone feeling because it's in your hand, not sitting on a table, uh, feeling more intimate could be something to that. Maybe there's a feeling of, of just paranoia that comes with that because a cell phone is constantly with you. There's a yep. sort of big brother aspect to it, aside from the more, yep, yep. you know, wholesome intimacy side of it. Uh, whereas, yeah, a laptop, you can shut it. And that's almost like you're, you know, shutting your window. You're like, ah, yeah. you can't see me now. I mean, even something like on iOS, I, I have a certain amount of people who are on Find My Friends. And, you know, I trust them. It's fine that they know where I am at all times. But they do know where I am at all times. Not on the laptop, though. So there's, you know, there's just that much of, mm -hmm. of a, uh, you know, oh, the cell phone, you can't get away with it. And e even On if a the laptop, study, maybe so. Even if the study is using someone else's cell phone, which I assume they are, you're probably not using your own cell phone in, if you're participating in this study. It's just the familiarity, right? It's the association yeah. to that. I think there, there's something to that. Uh, finally, Adam said, I have an iPhone 13 Pro that I got earlier this year. It was a big improvement from my iPhone 8, but I never felt like it was as snappy as it should be. I installed iOS 16 when it was released this week, and my phone feels light years faster. It opens quicker with Face ID, and it connects much better with my HomePod minis. I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but I wanted to share my experience. Adam, uh, that's great. I have not 
found that to be true with my iPhone 12, but it also isn't slower, so I don't know. I mean, I went from a 10 Pro Ma- 10, 10, 10S Max, yes, 10S Max, to the 13 Pro Max. And Adam, I have to say, I've been, I felt like uh, battery life was a little lackluster. I mean, you know, if I'm charging it regularly, I'm not really running out, but it wasn't lasting a whole lot longer than the phone I had in the past that was a little long in the tooth. However, I only did install iOS 16 yesterday, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at Keep that over the next week. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much to you, Max Scoville, for being with us today. I know you've had a very busy week, so we really appreciate your time. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Just head over to IGN.com, YouTube.com slash IGN, the various IGN platforms. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram as Max Scoville. Uh, yeah, we're doing all sorts of video game stuff, all sorts of entertainment stuff in general. Um, so keep an eye out. Yeah. Folks, go go to Max's stories on IGN and, and reload them so he gets good stats. Uh, t- tell him on Twitter. I get, at, I get paid per view. Just so, so good. <laughs> go and re- rewatch. Help them, Max please. eat. And thank him on Twitter for being on the show. Max Scoville at Twitter. Indeed. Also, thanks to our brand new boss. That brand new boss's name is Albert. Albert just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Albert. Welcome. Albert. Albert. Al- we Albert are so gets glad all to have you. Glory. Yes. Uh, Speaking of patrons, please do stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We talk about all the things, and a lot of it has to do with the show in an expanded way. You can catch this show, though, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow talking Ford Mustangs. And is there a future for auto shows with Tim Stevens? If anyone would know, he would. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>